It's a remarkable piece of footage. If it's a hoax, it's very well done. If it's, um, if it's not, then I would say it's probably revolutionary. It's a fake, in my opinion. If you continue to ask questions that are out of bounds, I won't hesitate to terminate this interview. This is powerful because this is not a staged event. This is real. Interest in UFOs and Area 51 is at an all-time high. Last year, a highly rated TV special and best-selling home video purported to show an actual autopsy of an alien being from the famous Roswell, New Mexico crash of 1947. Many people and even some experts believe that autopsy footage was genuine. If that was indeed the body of an alien being from another world, could the footage in this program be the world's first hard visual evidence of an actual living and breathing alien being? An alien being communicating in an interview with the highly covert arm of the U.S. government? If the footage we're about to show you is genuine, then this could very well be the most important video in the history of mankind, proving once and for all that we are not alone. Within Nevada's Nellis Air Force Range, protected by the tightest security in the world, is the Groom Lake Test Site, a.k.a. Dreamland, a.k.a. Area 51, an installation so secret the government cryptically acknowledges its existence only as an operating location. Until recently, the military flat out denied the presence of such a base. It has served as the testing ground for many secret research and development projects, such as the U-2 and SR-71 Blackbird spy planes, the F-117A stealth fighter, and now the SR-75 penetrator, the super secret replacement for the SR-71. Every morning, a select group of specialists with high security clearances, some reportedly as high as 38 levels above top secret, arrive at McCarran Airport in Las Vegas to be flown to Area 51 aboard a Boeing 737. From the time they leave the ground until they return to Las Vegas at the end of each working day, they enter a world no outsider can ever truly know, except through rumor and the occasional shocking revelation. In 1989, a physicist named Robert Lazar went public with the stunning claim that the United States government was test-flying disc-shaped aircraft of extraterrestrial origin at Area 51. Interviewed in silhouette by a Las Vegas TV reporter, Lazar, calling himself Dennis, claimed to be employed at a site on the outskirts of Area 51 known as S-4, where he was part of a team attempting to back-engineer the saucers to discover the secret of their advanced propulsion system. It was uh, a very sleek, thin what's up there absolutely alien craft there's no question about it well first of all the scope of the project was to back engineer it if they were United States craft we wouldn't be going backward trying to find out how they were built if we had built them uh, second of all the size of uh, the equipment inside the size of the seats the uh, materials that were in use completely alien to us pardon the pun and uh, you know the fuel 
element 115 essentially non-existent. Uh, all these factors together, uh, and of course the briefing information stating that they were alien craft. Along with Robert Lazar, rocket scientist David Adair is one of the few individuals who will go on record concerning his personal experiences with alien technology at Area 51. It was not of our origin. They shouldn't have let me see that. And then in the results of it, um, they um, locked me in a room. And the reason they locked me up in a room was because um, I wouldn't tell them any more about how the engine would function. And they started getting a little bit more perturbed about that. A former consultant to NASA and top aerospace companies, Adair claims that in 1971, he was brought in to study the engine of a downed flying saucer. What I was looking at was a technological marvel of its time, and uh, it was a magnificent thing to see the setting there. And it, the whole situation just started really getting me more angry than anything because the fact that they could sit on such a hunk of technology and not tell us about it. Here we are using liquid fuel engines and rockets at NASA, and here they've got an engine that's probably, uh, in theory that we know of, could be uh, a speed of light, an engine capable of speed of light or even faster. Ufologist and lecturer Sean David Morton has appeared on Sightings, Strange Universe, and Hard Copy. He offers his own perspective on Lazar's stunning claim and the super-secret Area 51. Area 51 is approximately 135 miles north of Las Vegas. It sits in a, in a box that's at the western middle corner of the Nellis test site. It was originally called the Groom Lake Facility, and Area 51 actually gets its name from a bombing classification. There's Area 49, 50, 51, 52, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that Robert Lazar told us was that if we simply went out to a black mailbox at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday nights, that we would actually see flying saucers, that these objects would test, and that this was the military testing time between 6.30 and 9.30, and then early in the morning between about 3 a.m. and about 6 a.m. Vigorous efforts have been made by employees of the government and others to debunk Lazar's claims and discredit him personally. Nevertheless, Area 51 has become the center of a raging controversy. Whether in fact certain clandestine agencies of the U.S. government are in secret contact with alien beings. Project Sigma was supposedly a deal between the United States government and various extraterrestrials that after the Roswell crash of 1947, that an organization called Majestic 12 was formed and then in 1953, President Eisenhower was then brought in on this. Well, there was a negotiation going back and forth between the United States military, the government, and the extraterrestrials. Apparently, we had a number of things that the extraterrestrials wanted. Number one, the military needed hardware. We wanted technology, we wanted weapons technology, propulsion technology, metallurgy technology, and in exchange for this, the ETs were willing to trade us uh, their hardware for our software, and software namely being us. What they primarily wanted was genetic material, and in exchange for that, they were willing to give us certain, certain technological uh, advances, like a number of flying saucers. It is out of Area 51 that the tape we are about to show you was supposedly smuggled. On Friday, July 26, 1996, the offices of Rocket Pictures, a producer-distributor of motion pictures and television programs, received a phone call. A male voice, identifying himself only as Victor, claimed to be in possession of a videotaped interview with an extraterrestrial being. Tom Coleman, president of Rocket Pictures, was intrigued enough to take the call. I, of course, thought this was some hoax. In fact, I, I thought it might have been my brother at one point. Uh, but as, uh, as we spoke, uh, this was someone who seemed to be very serious. Uh, we um, went back and forth on this, and I basically decided that, you know, this is a little bit too weird for me. Thank you and goodbye. Um, as I hung up, uh, I had a very strange feeling that maybe, just maybe, there was something here. He said he had a tape 
of a space alien, an ET, that was being held in a, a, a military installation in Nevada. Uh, I'm not sure it's a prisoner or a guest. Um, and uh, he had this on tape. As we've already heard from Sean Morton and others, this is not the first time allegations have surfaced that the U.S. government is playing host to extraterrestrial biological entities, or EBEs. The first and most famous alleged contact was the Roswell flying saucer crash of 1947. This is the incident from which the alien autopsy footage supposedly originated. But there have been persistent rumors that not all of the aliens retrieved from the Roswell crash were dead. The final fate of the survivors, if any, is unknown. Two years later, however, in 1949, another alien is reported to have survived a saucer crash, and this being, known as EBE-1, was taken into custody and kept at a safe house. EBE-1 supposedly suffered from chronic health problems, which the doctors of the time were helpless to treat. According to a controversial, possibly fraudulent briefing document dating from the Jimmy Carter administration, EBE-1 was interviewed by means of pictographs, from which it was learned that he came from the Zeta Reticula star system. Can we eliminate one or more of these categories from discussion? The laborious process of developing a set of symbols that could be used and understood by both human and alien amounted to the creation of a new language. If such an effort was made, it represents the greatest achievement in linguistics since the deciphering of the Rosetta Stone. That such an achievement would be kept secret illustrates the hysterical paranoia of the time as the Cold War intensified under the threat of nuclear annihilation. The so-called Carter Aquarius briefing document states that EBE-1 died of unknown causes on June 18, 1952. Skeptics who doubt the authenticity of the Carter Aquarius document find it unbelievable that highly advanced alien beings would allow one of their own to die under the primitive medical care of a species that had barely begun to conquer its own diseases. But as we will hear, there are those who claim that to the aliens, death is not a final end to be feared, but a mere transition. It was in the late 40s and early 50s that the U.S. government's policy toward UFOs was formulated. Publicly, there was Project Blue Book, which made a great show of gathering data on all the major UFO sightings, finally declaring them all to be hoaxes, mass hysteria, or swamp gas. But secretly, there may have been another policy at work. Over the years, several documents have come to light which seemingly confirm that a clandestine group, Operation Majestic 12 Group, a.k.a. MJ-12, was formed by special classified presidential order on September 24, 1947, for the express purpose of gathering information on UFOs and extraterrestrials, while at the same time keeping such information not only from unfriendly powers, but from the American public as well. If indeed Area 51 has become the nation's repository for alien technology and possibly alien visitors, then the extra constitutional justifications for such secrecy were developed in the MJ-12 group's planning sessions. James V. Forrestal, Secretary of Defense under President Harry Truman, is widely accused of being the mastermind behind the creation of MJ-12. Once created, Majestic may have expanded its mandate beyond what Forrestal had intended. Whatever secrets Forrestal may have known concerning flying saucers and alien visitors, that knowledge died with him when in 1949 he mysteriously plunged to his death from a window at Bethesda Naval Hospital. Though he was being treated for depression, 
Many UFO researchers doubt that his death was a suicide and point to the sinister workings of the possibly mythical MJ-12, which in their hypothesis may have been protecting its secrecy from a man who had come to believe the people had a right to know. As late as 1989, according to Bob Lazar, the identification badges at Area 51 read Madge for Majestic. In December 1994, a document purporting to be the Majestic 12 Group Special Operations Manual was leaked to a noted UFO researcher. It contains the following directive under the heading Isolation and Custody. EBEs will be detained by whatever means are necessary and removed to a secure location as soon as possible. There follows this disturbing amplification. Although it is preferable to maintain the physical well-being of any entity, the loss of EBE life is considered acceptable if conditions or delays to preserve that life in any way compromise the security of the operations. From the beginning of the UFO age, it seems, secrecy was always the government's prime directive. In 1988, another anonymous government source, codenamed Falcon, claimed that a second extraterrestrial biological entity, EBE-2, voluntarily became a guest of our government, allowing himself to be examined and interviewed. In this scenario, Area 51 became, for a time at least, a sort of extraterrestrial embassy the setting for mankind's first attempt at diplomacy with beings from another world. Different sources disagree as to how communication was established. There is universal agreement that the EBEs are incapable or unwilling to speak human language. In addition to the pictographs used by EBE-1, it has been reported by Falcon that in the early 1950s, EBE-2 was fitted with some sort of artificial voice box, allowing him to speak words, and that he learned the English language very rapidly. Other sources doubt this story, however. By our kind, do you mean we Americans? What has been reported most persistently is that the aliens communicate via thought projection or telepathy. They would have been tortured, made to give up their secrets, instead of questioned in this friendly manner. We cannot be forced to communicate. Has it been tried? Not by us. We speak to who's ever willing to listen. The idea of telepathic communication with alien beings carries with it the same doubts and controversy attached to telepathy itself. Do the practitioners of this ancient art really have the ability to read minds? Or are they crafty charlatans who simply tell the listener what he or she wants to hear? If the cynics are right, then the self-proclaimed telepaths recruited by the government in the 1950s were playing an astoundingly daring hoax by claiming to speak for the mute visitors from the stars. Defenders of telepathy call this notion preposterous and point to the long history of government-funded research into mind reading as proof that their science has merit. In the last four decades, there have been persistent, often contradictory rumors and even eyewitness accounts of other alien visitors meeting secretly with military or government officials. But what about today? The Tester Corporation has recently come out with a model kit of Gray, the extraterrestrial life form, and a scale model of the so-called sport model, the UFO Bob Lazar says he studied at Area 51. This UFO kit has quickly become one of the most successful model kits in the history of the company. If the military is, in fact, conducting tests of extraterrestrial spacecraft at Area 51, then where are the alien creators of the spacecraft? In his first TV appearance under the pseudonym Dennis, Bob Lazar was asked if there are living aliens at Area 51. Clearly nervous, 
He evaded the question by saying, quote, I really want to steer away from that right now, unquote. In subsequent interviews, however, he admitted catching a glimpse of two scientists talking to a strange short figure with long arms. He also reported seeing several documents that seemed to contain first-hand information on alien civilizations. Lazar is skeptical of a claim made by Falcon that a group of EBEs have been given complete control of a separate base within Dreamland but he does admit having read a report of a tragic misunderstanding between military personnel and alien beings in the late 70s. Lazar states that it had to do with bullets the MPs were carrying and that the bullets might explode, possibly due to a field the aliens had generated in that area. This encounter supposedly resulted in the deaths of all the humans involved by head wounds. But if there was ever a large-scale alien presence at Area 51, Lazar saw no evidence of it doing his work at S-4 in the late 80s. Is it possible that the deadly misunderstanding of 10 years earlier brought human-alien cooperation to an end? In his September 21, 1987 speech to the UN General Assembly, President Reagan himself did little to dispel the notion that this deadly misunderstanding brought human-alien cooperation to an end. In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Are the inconsistencies between various tales coming out of Area 51 evidence that these stories are lies? Or are the discrepancies the result of an intentional campaign of disinformation designed to discredit any elements of truth that may be reaching the public? If so, how does Victor fit into the jigsaw puzzle of questionable witnesses to the alien presence at Area 51? Is he a hoaxer, a government dupe, or a frightened whistleblower with the hard evidence to back up his story? I made it very clear to Victor that his credibility was the entire issue here, uh, and that everybody's going to think this is a hoax and that uh, how are they going to possibly verify this? Um, what he said was, you can do anything you want in terms of verified. Any type of due diligence, he will uh, answer whatever questions put forward. Um, we could do whatever type of checking. We could bring in experts. We could have the tape tested. We could, uh, in fact, he encouraged all of these uh, uh, aspects. Um, he just did not want his face and his real name revealed. At Coleman's insistence, Victor agreed reluctantly to appear on camera, but only in disguise, in shadow, and with his voice electronically altered. The questions were agreed upon in advance, but during the actual interview, the discussion occasionally deviated from Victor's approved questions. What is your occupation at Area 51? I won't answer that. I have had reason to be present at Area 51, and I'm not going to clarify whether or not I was there as an employee. Are you saying you were there as a visitor? I'm not going to specify why or in what capacity I was there, only that I was there. Can you tell us how many times you were there? When I agreed to this, my fundamental ground rule was that I would not be asked to divulge personal data that might help pinpoint my identity. If you continue to ask questions that are out of bounds, I won't hesitate to terminate this interview. Are you saying that the number of times you were present at Area 51 is enough to pinpoint your identity? Any specifics will narrow the field of suspects. Of course, I could lie. Let's say I've been there 47 times, or anyway, more than once. Let's turn to the tape itself. The copy you've supplied is not the original tape. No. Was the original at Area 51 when you copied it? That's out of bounds. Is it fair to assume that the copying of tapes at Area 51 is heavily restricted? You can assume anything you like. I would say that's a fair assumption. That's obvious. I will say that this tape was 
copied under special circumstances. Otherwise, copying it would have been impossible. Can you be more specific? More specific? Okay, I'm sure they've figured this much out already. Recently, there was a wholesale transfer of video documentation from analog tape to digital disk storage. In a couple of instances, this allowed data to leak from a highest security system to a less high security system. Even so, this particular tape was the only... I think that's about all I'll say about that. Was there something about this particular clip that made it more accessible to be copied? Not necessarily, no. Was there something about the content that caused them to file it differently or give it special handling? This interview was terminated. The interview resumed only after a discussion of the ground rules. Have you personally seen the alien being that appears in the tape? Yes, I have. But I stress I was not necessarily present at the interview session that appears on the tape. I'm not going to be specific. I may have encountered the being at another time. What can you tell us about the alien interview we're about to see? This one is rather recent, very late in the series. The interview process has been ongoing since the being arrived, which was in 1989. Approximately twice a month, they sit it down for a session that generally lasts from three to five hours. If they try to go longer than that, or if they schedule the sessions more frequently, the being becomes unresponsive. There's a fair amount of infighting among the scientists from different disciplines to get their questions asked. What is the alien revealed? Various minor technical details of the saucers. The physicists and engineers are frankly frustrated. They feel the being is withholding information. Possibly concepts are getting lost because all the information has to come through a telepath. But also it may be that the bulk of their scientific knowledge is just too advanced to be translated into our primitive conceptual framework. It's analogous to if a human scientist were to try to translate quantum mechanics into the grunts and screeches of a chimpanzee. That's not a very flattering comparison. Frankly, there's a high attrition rate for scientists in the program. You'd think they'd be energized by the challenge. But a lot of them take uh, the ego deflation very hard when they find out not only how much they don't know, but how much they aren't even capable of understanding. What else has the alien communicated? Oddly enough, the being seems to have a much easier time communicating spiritual concepts. The, the human body is a vehicle, a, a vessel. And the vessel must be maintained to serve this, the spirit. With maximum efficiency but a broken vessel can be replaced the human spirit or the soul can have many vessels is the process natural or technological both are uh, both are one technology is a, a natural excrescence of humanity technology is a is, is a process the vessel uses to perfect itself so this transference of the soul from vessel to vessel did your kind create the mechanics of it or is it a, a natural did it predate the intellectual creation for understanding must come acceptance. And it's not technological. Well, I think what he's trying to say is that the, the question is meaningless. The soul can travel from vessel to vessel. Uh, reincarnation, transfiguration, whatever. It's real. What I'm getting at is, does he know how it's done? Victor uses the term vessels to refer to the alien's conception of the body as a disposable vehicle for the soul. The UFO cult known as Heaven's Gate used the term containers in a similar context. The mass suicide of the Heaven's Gate cultists illustrates the dark side of accepting such ideas at face value. Doe, the Heaven's Gate cult leader, preached that humans can pass from container to container. The mysterious victor, on the other hand, harbors no such belief. 
In his interview, recorded months before the Rancho Santa Fe tragedy, Victor made his attachment to his own earthly vessel abundantly clear. And let me just state here publicly to head off any clever ideas anyone might be having. I have never been, am not now, and never will be suicidal. But how would the public know if something happened to you since we don't know who you are? I'm taking care of that, trust me. If something happens to me, if I die, people will know who I am. Do you think it's a reassuring sign that these aliens can communicate with us on a spiritual plane? It would be nice to think so, but I'm not sure if it's really such an achievement considering the mismatch between our intellects. I mean, you're not going to have much luck making your dog understand calculus, but if you pet him on the head and say, good dog, aren't you communicating spiritually? And doesn't the animal control officer say, good dog, when he comes to put some poor stray to sleep? Doesn't the vet try to reassure the animal just before he spays it? When you're dealing with beings whose intellect is so far beyond your own, I don't think it's safe to assume they have your best interests at heart. What about the content of the tape segments you brought? As I said, this is late in the series. In fact, it's quite close to the end. Because of his unwillingness to reveal his own identity, Victor's story stands or falls on the credibility of the tape he supplied. Here, exclusively, for the first time anywhere, is the uncut, uninterrupted alien interview tape, shown in its entirety in real time. You removed the soundtrack from the tape before you turned it over to this program. That's correct. I can't allow the voices of the project personnel to be heard by the general public. There's a very good chance their family or friends on the outside might recognize them. 
Is it your purpose in releasing this tape to expose Area 51 to the world? My purpose is to expose the existence of the aliens, not compromise these individuals. I made the decision to come forward. I'm taking precautions to protect my own identity, and I don't think it's fair for me to put these others in danger of exposure. In any case, the interview on the tape went nowhere. It was interrupted, as you'll see. Can you describe for us what we're seeing? All right, we're looking at the interview suite at S4. Uh, it's kept dark for the comfort of the aliens. The uh, figure who is just barely visible in the left foreground is the telepath, and behind the camera is a raked seating area for observers. Although in this case, I believe the only other person uh, present was a military aide. The alien is seated behind a glass partition in a biocontainment area, which is maintained at biosafety level 2, the lowest uh, designation. That's primarily for the uh, protection of the aliens, not us. The theory is that uh, if they were going to infect us with an alien bug, it would have happened 50 years ago. Um, in fact, uh, all the indications are the aliens eliminated microbial and viral life from their own ecosystem long ago. They aren't susceptible to our diseases directly, but it has been shown that microbes can reproduce and form colonies within their respiratory systems, which tends to exacerbate the debilities they seem to suffer anyway in our environment. Uh, in fact, you can see here, the alien is beginning to flag uh, the interview was not going well. The telepath was trying to clarify some points from a previous interview, but he wasn't receiving coherent responses. As you can see, the being is in real distress. At this point, the telepath is uh, sending out a message to the medical staff. Uh, he's trying to communicate with the alien, but he's getting no response. There's very little he can do. He, there's no direct connection between uh, his space and the uh, biocontainment area. That's the aide stepping in on the right. Uh, the medical staff should be there by now. They're, they're slow in responding. There they are. I have to say the medical personnel at S4 are less than first rate. They tend to be selected for their willingness to keep secrets rather than their medical competence. By the way, he's not shining that light into the eyes. It looks that way, but in fact, he's checking for hemorrhaging around the eye sockets and uh, in the nasal cavity. I'm sorry. It's very hard for me to watch this. You're asking me if I think this is real? That I've, have I finally seen a space alien? Um, you know, I don't know. But I do know this. I know that this is not a tricked up uh, version like the alien autopsy. Uh, it doesn't attempt to distract you away from the alien. Uh, it doesn't have that cinema verite, black and white. Uh, it doesn't go to great lengths to try to fool the audience. It's straight ahead. It's an alien on tape. Pretty much the way you'd probably film it. The point is this. What if it is real? In evaluating the authenticity of the alien interview tape, the logical place to begin is with the videotape itself. What can the technical details of this recording tell us about its origin? Rocket Pictures sent Victor's original tape to the Phoenix laboratory of renowned image analyst Jim Delatoso. Using the most up-to-date digital technology, Delatoso tried to determine the tape's authenticity. I've been exploring, looking at different aspects of the image itself to develop questions for a matrix on, is it real or is it fake? I grabbed a frame in the computer, 
and we're outputting it now in digital format and you can see that we have an absolutely solid picture. What we've done is taken the picture and moved it over so that we can look at the information that's in between the frames. Now, when we look at the motion video, we can see that it still is not bad. And when we have this little indicator down here, it tells me that the original image was transferred using some kind of time-based corrector. These are video screens up here, television, video monitors, and they're off at an angle. If this was shot using a video camera with lines on it, we would see more A patterns up there. And we don't see the more A patterns. So there's a probability that this was shot originally on film, possibly a film stock like 7252 or 7247, depending on the lighting. The idea that these images may have originated on film is in direct contradiction to Victor's statement that the interview was shot on video. On closer inspection, Delatoso decided the images could indeed have been recorded by a video camera under certain specific conditions. In this case, uh, I, I get the, the sense of it that this was originally created using um, uh, either film, transferred telecine to beta, but then this is the third generation, or it was taped under very low light conditions with the uh, video gain boosted probably 12 dB. Even the emotionless analysis of a computer cannot provide a definitive answer. De La Toso's efforts yield tantalizing hints, but in the end, they only increase the mystery. One of the key things about this creature are its eyes. Like the other experts, video analyst Jim Delatoso was emotionally affected by what he saw. He took the tape very seriously and offered this personal opinion. If someone faked this, I don't like these people. I think it's a bad thing for people to do because extraterrestrials come here. It's an incredibly important thing to understand who they are and why are they coming here. If this is not faked, I think we've got a glimpse here of a sense of, of communication with someone who came from a long distance away. When asked his opinion of the alien interview, Adair was careful to answer only in terms of his own experiences. If you're referring to the film where um, it's aliens being interrogated at Area 51, I don't know. I've never seen a UFO in my life. I've never seen aliens pickled in a jar or anything like that. But I know I saw an engine that wasn't from our terrestrial technology. If you look at an engine like that, it came out of a craft. If it come out of a craft, then that craft has occupants. So it's very logical to assume then that uh, those occupants could still be here and they could be interrogating them or they could have downed another craft since 1971. Makeup artist John Criswell has provided special effects creatures for many Hollywood motion pictures and television shows, such as Spaced Invaders and Babylon 5. Hired by Rocket Pictures to create the aliens for the recreation segments of this program, Criswell was very interested to finally see the real thing. By Hollywood standards, I, I would say this is it's, it's a pretty decent puppet. Well, to be honest with you, I, I would love to buy this being real, but it's probably a hoax. Well, I think this is a really cool design, and it's, it's a great concept, but I think I could have done better. Whoever did this, I mean, they, they could have a job in Hollywood in a, in a minute. Um, no problem. This one has a much creepier quality than the, than the alien autopsy tape, I think. Um, that, one, that one I definitely didn't buy just because of the, of the way it laid on the table. Um, there was a couple of things. This actually, whoever did this was, or if someone did this, they were very clever because it, it you know, it, it hides a lot of stuff. So that's what makes me kind of disbelieve it a, a little bit. But, you know, who knows? 
Criswell thought the alien exhibited movements that would be difficult to fake. There are, there are moments when it, it, this looks very real, and, and I don't know how they did certain little things about this. Um, so right, right when I would say that it's definitely a puppet, he, he moves a certain way or, or, he'll, or he'll lift up in the frame and all that. And all these little things are important to the, you know, to the character of him. Academy Award winner Rick Baker is one of Hollywood's reigning masters of makeup effects. He transformed Eddie Murphy into a 300-pound man for The Nutty Professor and has created monsters for countless films, including An American Werewolf in London and the UFO-related Men in Black. Baker dismissed the tape as a fake. Yeah, I don't, this, this doesn't fool me. I don't buy this. I think this is a puppet, and, and you've got a table in the foreground that's hiding the rest of his body. You've got some kind of the, whatever that instrument is in the foreground. It's, uh, I mean, it's also lit very mysteriously. I, I think if you were going to record this alien, you would want to see it, and, and you wouldn't want to hide it behind a table, and you would light it in, in a way that it would show up much more than this. And this particular movement, this head jerking movement here especially, looks very puppety to me. It looks a little overdone, and, uh, and very much like a guy with his hand inside this thing. Is he supposed to be ill here? Is that what's going on? I, uh, it, it just looks like they went to a great deal of effort to hide as much of the anatomy uh, other than the head on this, his, on this puppet. And, uh, I, just, I just don't buy it. I would be willing to stake my reputation on the fact that I think this is a, a, a hoax. It's very interesting to see them. In Baker's opinion, there was no controversy at all. It's a fake in my opinion. We could build better. We have built better. <laughs> UFO expert Robert Dean, on the other hand, had no doubt whatsoever that the tape was authentic. This is powerful because this is not a staged event. This is real. In the 1960s, Robert O. Dean served as an army intelligence analyst at NATO headquarters in Europe where he claims to have seen first-hand evidence of alien beings and their artifacts. Retired from the Army, he is now a highly regarded UFO researcher and analyst. Dean was asked to view the tape and offer his expert opinion. Treating him like a piece of livestock, wiping his lips. Calling on his own first-hand experience for comparison, Robert Dean was stunned and moved by what he saw. That breaks my heart. I think you've got yourself a piece of legitimate footage here, and I think you've got your hands on some pretty sensitive material. I don't know how the hell you got this. I don't know who you got it from, and frankly, I don't want to know who you got it from. But you got yourself a tiger by the tail with this footage. I would say, and I know that that's one of the things you ask of me, is that you've got yourself some legitimate footage of one of the little guys being interrogated and filmed. And there's a reality to it, and there's a sensitivity to it that literally breaks my heart. But I tell you very much, very strongly, you've got something here that is very sensitive. Well, I know that the level of classification on this kind of a thing is so far damned above top secret that you won't even, you can't imagine how sensitive this kind of thing is and how delicate it is and how tightly the government sits on anything like this. Sean Morton looked for clues to the tape's authenticity in the technical details of the interview setting. Okay, there's a, a couple of interesting things about the tape right off the bat. Morton tried to decipher the time code at the bottom of the screen. First off, what you're looking at in the time code is DNI's Department of Naval Intelligence. So Department of Naval Intelligence, this would, this would probably be a file number 27. It could be a security level, however, um, because security levels are supposedly go up to uh, Q36, or the highest ones that we know about. The first interesting thing about that is that I'm noticing uh, uh, what looks like a medical monitor and look at how slowly and erratic the heartbeat is. The heartbeat is literally one, two, 
It's very, very erratic, and it looks as though the, the heartbeat being as erratic as it is is only about, mm, from counting that, it looks like a, it, it's about 30 a, a minute or so. Morton suggested an alternate explanation for the video's dim lighting. Uh, one of the unusual things about, the, about most of these particular race of aliens is they are very, very sensitive to light. So a lot of these interviews are conducted in, um, uh, in very darkened rooms. To Morton's eye, many features of this alien dovetailed with accounts of other first-hand contactees. Uh, another strange thing about the physiognomy of these creatures is as well is if you will notice that the, that the neck itself is not at the back of the head like a human being is. The neck is actually in the center of the head, which is what actually gives, gives it problems uh, uh, holding its head and its, and its neck up. Um, whatever this is, it's being taken, the interview is actually being done through a piece of glass. Uh, which is probably something somebody fake, faking the photo, photographs probably wouldn't think about. Right there we see that the, the creature appears to be choking. The, the dark eyes in many cases uh, are actually a, a form of lens um, that uh, guards the creature against untoward sunlight. It's a, it's a remarkable piece of footage. I mean it's very 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 interesting. If it's a, if it's a hoax it's um, it's it's very well done. If it's um, if it's not, then I would say it's probably revolutionary. Another expert who was asked to examine the tape was Michael Hesseman, one of Europe's leading UFO researchers and author of the international bestseller Beyond Roswell. When I got the first information about the alien interview footage, and when I saw the first picture, I said there might be a connection to a real incident. Hesseman was intrigued both by the alien's appearance and by Victor's claim that the being arrived at Area 51 in 1989. If it is authentic, it might be the most significant film ever published, ever shown on television. For several years now, Hesseman has been investigating reports that the South African Air Force shot down a flying saucer in the Kalahari Desert in 1989. According to Hesseman's sources, two survivors were retrieved from the downed saucer. One was sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, and the other to Area 51. The extraterrestrial in Victor's tape bears a striking resemblance to descriptions of the Kalahari ET. And the timing of its appearance at Area 51 is consistent with the South African incident. If you see the drawings we have of the Kalahari alien and the descriptions we have, it seems to be the same being. And the Kalahari incident puts the alien interview footage into a context and gives it at least a probability that it might be real. It might be the real stuff. We just don't know. Whitley Strieber, best-selling author of Communion, claims to have had numerous personal contacts with alien beings. He has become the de facto spokesman for the growing number of people who claim to have been abducted by extraterrestrials. The nationally syndicated television program Strange Universe asked Strieber and several other abductees to view the alien interview tape. What Strieber saw left him profoundly shaken. Strieber would not agree to be interviewed on camera for this program, but on Strange Universe, he had this to say. On May 23, 1997, Victor gave a radio interview on the nationally syndicated show Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. Speaking by telephone from an unknown location, Victor answered questions from host Art Bell and his guest, UFO expert Sean Morton. From the Kingdom of Nye, Coast to Coast AM continues with Art Bell. It is going to be a very interesting morning. 
Uh, let's see if we've got Victor on the line. Victor, are you there? I'm here. Welcome to the program, Victor. Afterwards, this is what Bell and Morton had to say about Victor's credibility. What a hell of an interview, huh? Boy, oh boy, talk about making history on the radio. It was, as far as I could tell, he answered every question properly as far as exactly where the locations are to the, you know, descriptions of the, you know, the transports, the 737s to the, uh, to the CTS 43s, um, the retinal scans, the five levels at S4. A veteran of countless controversial interviews, Art Bell still found himself impressed by his encounter with Victor. In the first, um, I think, half hour, I sensed that I was uh, getting a, a kind of a runaround or that I was not satisfied with the quality of the answers that I was being given. But as the interview progressed and Victor, to some degree, began to relax, I began to uh, get a different sense, and that was that um, he was telling me the truth. I think Victor was scared. I think Victor really is scared. And so I, my judgment of the interview after about the first, oh, maybe 20 minutes, half hour, is that we began to get some real information. It was a significant uh, milestone. Now, there's no question about that in broadcasting. If the government has really been in contact with superior aliens, wouldn't we see some evidence of it? For instance, amazing new scientific discoveries. Limitless free energy, a cure for cancer. We might, if the government's motive were the betterment of mankind. The government's motive is control. And just as much as they crave control, they fear loss of control. Knowledge is power, but power does not necessarily confer competence. The people at the top of this program are intellectually very average. They're not capable of making proper use of what's been handed to them, but they have no intention of letting anyone else ever get a chance to solve the puzzle. And let's not forget there's also the real possibility that the government is being manipulated by the extraterrestrials for their own purposes. You could have released this tape to the news media, but you insisted on being paid for it. Doesn't that cast doubt on your own motives? Yes, and I was aware of that going in, but that's a cross I'm prepared to bear. I find it disgusting that the most important event in human history is being kept secret simply because certain unimaginative officials have the power to do so. But at the same time, I do see the irony in my own actions. All I can say is, had I had the choice, I would not have insisted on profiting from this revelation. But since by lifting this veil, I've endangered not only my career, but possibly my life, I felt the need for some small measure of monetary freedom to deal with any eventualities. And let me say, I could have demanded significantly more money than I did if I had been willing to compromise my anonymity. There have been other whistleblowers who jumped at the chance to become celebrities, which I think casts even more doubt on their motives than some people may be casting on mine. Do you believe your life is in danger as a result of